questions that you submitted. Um, I've got heaps to get through because your questions were so fantastic. I think I said to Mel, I could give this two hours, but I'll try and push through in my time limit. Um, I'm chatting to you first about, I guess, what is anxiety um, from a psychological perspective, be able to describe maybe the difference between experiencing anxiety and having a anxiety disorder. Amusingly, I'm experiencing some anxiety myself right now because I've got to give a presentation. But on top of that, right before we started, my whiteboard fell on me. You better believe I have all of the symptoms that a lot of our um, young people are probably going through, rushing through me after having that fall on me. So anxiety can pop up at any moment. I thought I might start you off with my most favorite video about why we experience anxiety ever. And I'm showing this to people of all ages, not just our young people. So I hope it will be applicable to you guys as well. I always say we always live in fear that you can't hear the sound. So somebody just stick their hand up if you can't hear it, but we think we've done enough testing. The human mind has evolved to think in such a way that it naturally creates psychological suffering. You see, back in the Stone Age, 200,000 years ago, life was pretty dangerous for our caveman ancestors. So if a caveman or cavewoman wanted to survive, their minds had to constantly be on the lookout for things that might hurt or harm them. And if that cave person's mind wasn't good at predicting, spotting or avoiding danger, what happened to her? The default setting of the caveman mind was safety first. And we in the modern world have inherited this. Our modern minds are constantly warning us of things that might hurt or harm us. The caveman mind says, watch out, there might be a bear in that cave, you could get eaten. Watch out, that shadow on the horizon might be an enemy from another clan, you could get speared. Our modern mind then does worrying, predicting the worst, avoiding anything that scares you, anxiety in all of its different forms. Back in caveman days, you survive an encounter with a bear or a wolf, then it's useful to replay it. It's useful for your mind to go over the events and remember what you did to survive so that you're better prepared for next time. But in our modern world, we go over and over painful memories, dwelling on them, reliving them, even when there's nothing useful to learn or the lesson has been well and truly learned a long time ago. In the Stone Age era, as a caveman or cavewoman, you have to fit in with the group. If you are alone, you will soon die. So your mind compares you to others in the group. Am I fitting in? Am I contributing enough? Am I following the rules? Am I doing anything that might get me thrown out? Now, in modern life, we're always comparing ourselves to others. But the problem is, we're no longer in a small group. Our groups are enormous today, and we carry with us devices that constantly feed us images and stories of people all over the planet. This constant comparison ramps up our fear of being judged or rejected, or not fitting in, or just not being good enough. The caveman mind tells you, you need more food, you need more water, better weapons, better shelter. The cave people who thought this way lived longer and had more offspring. Unfortunately, in the modern world, this manifests as greed, dissatisfaction, craving, wanting, it's never enough, I need more, more, more. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, the Stone Age thought patterns are intensified by the sheer pace and complexity of modern life. Our frantic existence, rushing from task to task, that never-ending to-do list. So, when your mind starts doing this unhelpful stuff, as all minds do, remember, it's not defective or abnormal. And it's not deliberately trying to make your life difficult. It's simply doing the job it has evolved to do, trying to keep you safe and save you from pain. 
I realized halfway through that we were really zoomed in on that video. So you might have missed some of the pictures going on the outside. But if you could hear that, I think it described the way that our brains operate pretty well. I show that that video particularly around here at OAC. I like the part there where it talks about back in caveman days, if you didn't fit into the group, if you weren't being kind, if you weren't contributing enough, if you weren't being a good enough friend partner, you were at risk of being kicked out of the group and that made you really, really vulnerable. Um, and that's sort of the way that we would conceptualise social anxiety today. You know, there's a really good reason why our brains are programmed to worry about whether we are fitting in, if we're saying the right thing. And we know that social anxiety is something that most of our young people suffer from at OAC. So I guess I connect that back to that video as well. There is a number of really good reasons why our young people and us as well experience all of the body symptoms that are associated with having anxiety. And if I use me as an example, after my whiteboard's fallen on me, I'm feeling pretty jittery. My hands, I'm fidgeting, I'm moving. And if we replace a whiteboard with, say, a saber-toothed tiger, that makes sense. That means my body's ready to fight or run away or freeze and hide if I need to. Um, my whiteboard is probably not as life-threatening as a saber-toothed tiger, but my brain doesn't know the difference. On this slide here, I've got a couple, it's probably a bit small for you, I apologise. I've got a number of the really common body symptoms that a lot of us experience when we are experiencing anxiety. And I would imagine you can probably connect with this, you know, every time you've had to go to a job interview or when you've taken your child to school for the first day, you might have been really worried and anxious about how that was going to go if they tried sport for the first time. If you have to have a difficult conversation with somebody, all of our bodies do this and there's a really, really good reason why they do. It's our brain and our body trying to keep us safe from danger, even though there's not many saber-toothed tigers around anymore. So some of the most common ones on there, um, I speak to young people about having tense muscles, not noticing that they're clenched up, that they might get to the end of the day and they're really tired or their muscles are sore. A lot of young people talk to me about hyperventilating or getting dizzy. A lot of young people might talk to me about my heart feels like it's beating out of my chest, I'm shaky. And probably around here, the most common one being I can't stop thinking about the things that I'm worried about. A lot of young people will say to me, I have concentration issues, I can't concentrate in, ch in class, do I have ADHD? Often I can bring that back with a little bit of questioning to, well, what it, what's your brain taking you to? Are you worrying about all of the things going on in your life? And that makes sense if we had a saber-toothed tiger in front of us and we were like, oh, it's cool, I'll think about that later. We're at risk of not surviving. So that's kind of a description of why our body symptoms turn up when we are worried about something. And I'll gloss over this really quickly. When I'm talking about an anxiety disorder, because experiencing anxiety is normal. That's our brain being at the end of that video there with the hat on for employee of the month. It's working the way that we want it to. But if someone's experiencing an anxiety disorder, it means that those physiological responses in their body, those worries are starting to create difficulty and suffering in their life. It's starting to get in the way of them living their life, participating in school, um, just generally participating the way that we would want them to. So that's when I might come in and say, it sounds like we've got an anxiety disorder. Now, there's more than one anxiety disorder, and I don't want to bore you with all the different types. But I created this slide, I guess, to talk to teachers and to talk to parents about this can kind of be helpful in terms of creating a treatment plan or targeting and helping young people the way that's going to be most useful to them. So most of our anxiety disorders have something that we're afraid of and then the avoidance pattern that they get into to try and make sure that scary thing never happens. So that probably makes sense with that specific phobia there. So I've got the example of needles. If you're afraid of needles, you're going to avoid needles. That makes sense. When it comes to our young people at OAC, that is usually a bit more complicated. 
And when I'm asking young people, why aren't you able to come to class or why is it difficult for you to speak up or ask a question? There's usually lots and lots of different reasons behind that. So if I'm talking about social anxiety, that's often I can't get my work started because what if my teacher thinks it's terrible or what if I answer a question in class and other kids think I'm silly? Um, what if I prove to myself that I'm silly? It can be pretty complicated. If we've got generalised anxiety, a young person usually worries about everything. And if we have something like panic disorder, our young people might worry that my body symptoms that we talked about in the previous slide are going to become overwhelming and I'm not going to be able to stop having a panic attack or control them. So I might avoid anything that makes me slightly anxious or anything that reminds me of those body symptoms. So sometimes that can be class as well. So there's lots of quite complicated reasons why we might feel anxious. I know a lot of the questions from parents was, what can we do about anxiety? Um, and I think that's a pretty long answer. Most of the time that's going to depend on what a young person is afraid of. But I thought I'd give you a bit of a general summary of how we treat anxiety, how I treat anxiety here at OAC, but generally what the research is behind what works. So at the crux of anxiety treatments, we really are talking about being brave and that I guess at its most simplistic terms means noticing what scares you and doing it anyway. And I know that's harder than it sounds. I often say to young people, if you're afraid of heights, I wouldn't take you straight to the top of Mount Lofty. You'd never come with me anyway. That would be very cruel. But what we would start talking about is how can we break Mount Lofty down into smaller pieces so that eventually you're going to feel confident enough to go up there. So I've got a slide in a few slides time that I'll break that down a little bit more, but essentially we're talking about exposure therapy. At the crux of exposure therapy, we're talking about being brave. We're also talking about sitting with painful emotions. I think we're taught out there, aren't we, that you know, emotions are something to get rid of, to ignore, to push over here, don't cry, don't feel angry, don't do these things. But most of the time, if we try and wrestle with something and get rid of it, it comes back bigger and nastier than ever. So a big part of coping with anxiety is also coping with the painful emotions that come up. And usually that's pretty complicated. Another thing we're doing is challenging our thoughts. And probably the biggest part of sitting with anxiety is knowing that all of those body symptoms we talked about are, number one, normal and helpful if we've got a saber-toothed tiger in the room but also that they don't last forever. I think most of us can probably remember the last time we were the happiest we were in our lives. And I would imagine we're probably not still up there today. It's a bummer, but most of our emotions and most of our body symptoms can't stay up here forever. And that includes anxiety. This is one of my favorite diagrams ever. And it really kind of boils anxiety treatment down to one thing. So I can take most young people's experience and say, okay, what's going on? And we can put it into this cycle. So a young person experiences anxiety, their body turns up, their physical symptoms turn up, they're scanning for danger, they're really anxious, and they're pretty motivated to avoid or escape. But when we do that, in the short term, you feel better, but Always in the long term, we're asking ourselves, why couldn't I do that? Why couldn't I get to class? Everyone else can get to class. What's going on? And it just maintains that painful cycle of anxiety. So the way that we break that is targeting those avoidance patterns. And what usually happens is in the short term, our young people feel more anxious and I'll prep them for that you are going to feel more anxious. That's not going to go away. But over time, they start to feel more confident. They start to develop coping skills and all of those long-term nasty impacts of avoiding the thing that you're afraid of start to fade away. And you can feel more brave and more confident and more like you're achieving what you're hoping to achieve. And it's pretty cool to see.
So I probably sound like a broken record to the young people I'm speaking to, but this is my favorite quote in the world. Anxiety is your body's way of telling you this is important to me. So we might start to reframe our body cues as our body's way of telling us something needs to change here because we wouldn't feel anxious if we didn't care about it. So for our young people at OAC, that might be, well, actually, I do love learning when I can get there and I really want to participate. I want to make friends. It could be, I want to make my parents proud. It could be, I want to do something different in my day. I'm feeling really stuck. There is always a care factor behind the reason why we're feeling anxious about something. Young people can't always articulate that. But if we didn't get anxious, we wouldn't care. It wouldn't be important to us. So I'm always trying to drive this one home. So I touched before on going to the top of Mount Lofty if you're afraid of heights. What I'm talking about here, I guess as a psychologist, is I'm putting together an exposure therapy hierarchy. So that would mean trying to use all of my creative talents and skills with young people in breaking down the thing that they're most afraid of. So this is an example of a seven-year-old young person who has separation anxiety. So separation anxiety, by definition, is a fear that something will happen to them or something will happen to their parent if they're not together. And I guess around OAC, that's pretty common. So at the start of this hierarchy, the child can't sleep alone and they'll sleep in their parents' bed. So I might say to that young person, okay, what would be the end goal? What would be a 10 out of 10 for anxiety? The top of Mount Lofty for you. For this young person, it was sleeping in their own bedroom. So if I break that down to the smallest possible thing they could do, that was staying inside and playing while mum puts the washing on the line. We're not together in the same room. I can still see her, but we're still separate. So we might do that in the first week. In the second week, they listed staying at home while mum visits the neighbour for 10 minutes. That jumped up to a three. So that was pretty brave of them to attempt that. And also a three was sleeping on a mattress next to mum's bed. Tiny bit further than where we were, but still achievable by that point. Next part we had, they stay at home with dad while mum goes to the shopping for half an hour. And I, I was really clear about that. That's only going to be half an hour. We've got a time. My mum will be back by that time. That was a four for them. Sleeping on a mattress on the floor in the doorway of their parents' room. So slowly we're getting out into the hallway and then eventually into their room. This young person at seven was able to stay at home with dad while mum went out for lunch then being able to stay out with dad while mum goes out for an evening meal, staying at home with a trusted adult while mum and dad went out for just 30 minutes. That was a pretty short date night for them. And then staying at home with another trusted adult while mum and dad go out for the evening. And then we were able to extend that out to sleeping in their own bedroom. And by the time you got to a 10 out of 10, it usually doesn't feel like a 10 out of 10. But when I'm writing this with young people at the start, it probably feels like a 20 out of 10. So this is an example of how I might put into practice a exposure hierarchy in therapy. Um, but I really want to send out the message that this isn't accessible. This shouldn't be inaccessible to parents. Um, if you can take something that a young person is afraid of and try and break it down into smaller, more achievable steps, which I would imagine you're already doing, that's exposure therapy. All right, I'm going to whip through these because I know I've taken up heaps of time. A lot of people are always asking me, what are my best anxiety reduction activities? The first one's probably really obvious. You would have known probably this from TV or from therapy, grounding. It's my favourite because in the moment just gets you out of your head for 10 seconds. So what's five things you can see, four things you can feel, three things you can hear, and I often say to young people, don't get caught up in the, was it five things I can see or was it five things I can touch? I can't remember which way it goes. Doesn't matter. Start with five things you can see and then just try and do one of each of your senses. Anything that gets you out of that panic mode is going to be useful. I'm skipping this video, but there's heaps of videos out there about structured breathing. And I know everyone would have their own techniques. Is it 10 to 1? Is it 4, 3? Is it a box breathing? This is my favourite one. I can send it out because it just shows you visually a circle. 
that goes in and out and you have to try and match your breathing to that. I just like to have a bit of guidance when I feel like I'm in panic mode that I can anchor myself to that video and I can just copy it. I don't have to think about anything else. This is an activity just being your own lawyer. So when um, hopefully most of our young people wouldn't have too much interaction with the court system, but if they're watching on TV, they can usually understand what I'm talking about when I say, when you go to court, there's somebody arguing that, yes, this is true. And the other person arguing, no, it's not true. And we can do that with our thoughts. We can throw up our thought. I look silly in class. Give me all the evidence that this is true. Okay, actually give me the evidence that this might not be true. And that can help us think in a little bit more of a balanced way that incorporates both sides of the argument. Young people usually get on board with me for this. And we can make it a little bit silly too. I can pretend to be the judge. I think my final suggestion for you is don't um, undersell the value of coping statements. And this is where a parent can come in and be really useful, I think. So some examples on here. I know you can cope no matter what happens. My favourite saying, anxiety is your body's way of telling you this is important. I'm proud of you for being brave. This feeling is uncomfortable, but it won't last forever. Anxiety is not the boss of you. You've been brave before. Remember, here's an example. I know you can be brave again. Just reminding young people of some of those key things we've talked about today. This doesn't last forever and you can be brave. My final statement, I guess, one of the most useful things that you can do as a parent is to role model calm and safety when children display anxiety. They're always going to be looking to you for, is this safe? Is this okay? When you say some of those coping statements, when you be brave yourself, when you reach out for support, when you do hard things, uh, you show your young people that you can be brave and you can push through anxiety. So don't undersell the value of your amazing role as parents would be my final statement. All yours, Mel. I oh. hope I'm to time. I don't know. That's fine. We'll work this out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about a bit about anxiety and aut autism. And so, so what what causes anxiety and autism? Well, research indicates that children, uh, young people with autism, are more likely to experience anxiety disorders than their neurotypical peers. Because they're the reasons why are that they're more sensitive to sensory thing uh, sensitivities like um, may experience overwhelming anxiety at family say it was a family gathering, and you've got lots of no conversations, clinking dishes, more music, lots of things going on. So they might feel overwhelmed in that kind of situation, or you might be at a grocery store and you might have the fluorescent lights, crowded aisles, and all the different smells and sounds might be a trigger as well for the anxiety. Uh, there's also difficulty with change. So um, sudden change in the routine can cause anxiety in um, individuals with autism. Uh, or it might be that you have to cancel a trip to the park because the weather's got or it started raining. So that might, I mean, you can't help it, but that might trigger their anxiety and they might be upset about that. Um, or it might be an unexpected guest arrives at your house. Even think little things like that might trigger anxiety in, in people with autism. Um, also social challenges. So um, might feel increased anxiety. I mean, we all feel anxious going to a new place, but it's even more so because of social difficulties um, and understanding social cues is more challenging for people with autism. So they might experience even more anxiety than we uh, neurotypical people would. Um, and they might avoid things like that if possible if they uh, to avoid that anxiety um and what was the other one communication barriers oh, yeah also expressing their needs and feelings so they might feel frustrated um because they can't express how they're feeling and that might increase their anxiety in all situations so what can we do to help so some of the strategies uh, Sasha said, which I'll talk about, but there's other things that I've uh, put in here. So providing a safe and calm environment. So um, some of you might already have this in your home already, but if you haven't, this is, it's a good idea to set up a little calm space or corner or somewhere where um, the young person can go and just um, have a quiet space and time to 
reset and re uh, help themselves um, somewhere that's not you know not it doesn't have loud noises or bright lights somewhere quiet so there's some examples on the slide here some pictures some of them for younger people some of them a bit older um, and introducing calming activities as Sasha already said about the deep breathing or it might be reading or drawing or soothing music it's, it's different for everyone so it's up to you to um, up to individual preference so um, so using all those things will help help calm when they're feeling a bit anxious there's also some other things here I've, I've written down so it might even be smells so uh, aromatherapy sometimes good some smells help people calm um, and comfort things like bean bags and cocoons or uh, uh, somewhere they can hide sometimes is their preference so and creating a predictable routine so um, because of uh, the anxiety about change uh, young people with autism prefer consistency, maintaining a regular schedule and providing us like provides a sense of stability and predictability for them. So having say, say having the same meal times, same bedtime, things like that every day, it does help them feel a bit calmer and, and um, manage their anxiety better. Um, visual schedules are good. So I've got a couple of examples here. I mean, you can just write it on a whiteboard like that person's done, or you could have um, print out and tick things off or depending on your child and their level of need but there's also visuals uh, visual schedules as well so having those kind of things will help them to know what's coming up next predicting like instead of them thinking what are we doing right now what's going to happen after all those thoughts are going through their head probably so having a visual schedule lets them know what's coming up what the, and also what they've already achieved for the day so it might be good for their self-esteem saying I can tick these I've done all these things today and also preparing if possible like there's always things that happen that you can't be prepared for but preparing your uh, the young person or child for changes that are happening maybe it's changed like you've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow or um you've got a you're going to someone's birthday or anything like that so just letting them know ahead of time so they've they've processed that and they're ready for that change and using clear and consistent communication so using simple clear language instead of saying instead of saying something like we need to be out of the house exactly 8 15 to ensure we arrive on time or you could just say we need to leave 8 15 for our appointment like you know not keeping it clear and simple is a bit easier for, uh, and lowers anxiety um having visual aids sometimes social stories help with some people with autism um just helps them anticipate what's happening and also um the first then chart I don't know if people have used that before just saying oh first we're going to do this then you can have your games or whatever is helpful uh, for a lot of students with autism um, and encouraging them to express their feelings and reassuring that reassuring them that it's okay to feel anxious like like Sasha was saying everyone experiences anxiety and feels anxious so it's normal it's just um, helping them understand that that's normal and it's okay and helping them with strategies to help themselves calm. So some of the things that Sasha's already mentioned, like drink breathing, some mindfulness and uh, activities are great. Progressive muscle relaxation, so tensing your muscles and relaxing slowly is another good thing to do for your coping strategies. Um, and also what this is what Sasha was talking about before too, um, gradual exposure to the, the um, fear and positive reinforcement when they're when they are successful at managing their anxiety and also modeling modeling is really important i find that as um i'm a teacher as well and modeling my my behavior is of uh needs to is how much i'm not getting it out right i'm modeling is really important so i feel like i'm a role model and that i have to the way i behave needs to um the students to take that on so if i may I, I see something goes wrong I say, oh, oops, you know, you know, I made a mistake. Everyone makes mistakes. Don't worry about it. And then I'll continue on. So, you know, just normalizing that things go wrong. It's okay. Things like that. So we're all role models and all the parents. I'm a parent too. So I'm, we're all role models for our young people. So, and also if, if you are still 
needing help, you could seek help from therapists or counsellors. Uh, occupational therapists also give advice on sen some sensory processing issues if you have an occupational therapist or, you know, even if it's severe anxiety, that's like um, you might need medication for a short time just to help with that. You never know. But the other thing I want to talk about is because a few parents have, um, in the questions that were asked during the enrolment for this session, a few parents asked me to talk about PDA. So um, I'm just going to go over it quickly because there's a lot there, but I'm just going to talk about it briefly. It's, it's, it's uh, pathological demand avoidance. So that's what PDA stands for. It's not actually recognised on the diagnostics but uh, for autism, but it's recognised subtype or profile. Uh, so people, um, individuals with EDA, um, PDA, uh, they have the same, the same uh, traits as people with autism, but they also display these things. So they might resist and avoid ordinary demands of life, like brushing your teeth or put your shoes on, all those kinds of things. Uh, they might, uh, they will use, they're very good at using social strategies to like avoidance, distraction, giving excuses, delaying, withdrawing, all those things, drowning out the request with noise, you know, all those kind of things to avoid that task, whatever it is. Um, they're very good, uh, they might appear social, but have some gaps in their social understanding. Um, and they might experience excessive mood swings, impulsivity, and they may also display fascinations, which could be positive or negative with uh, individuals. So they might get really attached to one person and really focus on them. So for uh, individual with PDA might be a, um, there's a different escalation process. This was something the Newcastle University found um, has drawn up. So um, they might use those strategies I just mentioned. They, um, if a demand is made of them, they might use uh, things like um, distraction excuses and all these things until it reaches the panic mode. So they um, perceive any demand as uh, anxiety provoking. So they, as a threat, basically. So um, if you ask, you say, put, you need to put your shoes on now. That will be uh, like, oh, I don't want to do that and go into panic. It could go from calm to panic mode as well. So those kind of demands are um, very threatening to uh, people with the PDA profile, even though obviously you're not using a threatening voice when you do it. <laughs> so, but <laughs> you, it's just that they find that threatening, that behaviour. Um, so anyway, this is this is um, the PDA Society recommends this kind of strategy. It's called Panda. So Panda is uh, like um, pick your battles. So picking your battles, which you probably heard before, like instead of always trying to um, push back, maybe if it's if they don't want to wear those shoes you want them to wear, you just say fine, pick whatever shoes you want. As long as you, you don't care what shoes they're wearing, as long as they got something on their feet when you leave. Um, and then anxiety management, so using the low arousal approach um, and thinking ahead, think, you know, recognising underlying social anxiety, uh, anxiety and social sensory challenges, so the kind of things we've been talking about today. So um, negotiation and collaboration, so keeping calm and negotiating to solve challenges, so if you've got an issue, how can we fix it? Fairness and trust are really important to students with PDA. Um, and then disguise and manage demand. So that's um, using different language, basically. Instead of using a demanding language, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, um, using declarative language, which I'll talk about in a second. And then adaption. So you might be humorous or distract them with something or be flexible, have another plan, all those things. Um, and that they will help with um, this person with PDA. So creating a low demand environment. So instead of a strict routine, so we we're talking about routines before for students with autism, but with PDA profile, you might have to change that thinking. So um, so you might say, would you like to have breakfast first or get dressed? So they've got a choice. So you're not demanding they do one or the other. You're saying, which would you like to do? At least you, you're still going to get one of the things you want done but they've got a choice about it. So that makes it to them, they perceive that as I've got some control over this situation. Um, same as you might say, uh, here are the choices for your week. 
which ones do you want to do today? So they get to choose. So they're still doing the activity, you're just giving them choices. And reducing pressures, not putting demands like do it immediately, things like that. I know some teachers have tomorrow box. So you say, okay, do you want to do it now or put it in tomorrow and then you'll do it tomorrow, things like that. You can even do that at home too. Like, oh, you want to do it now or you want to do it in the morning. Giving a time choice is also good for things like that too. Um, and avoiding power struggles. So like I said a minute ago, non-confrontational, -confront giving choices um, and then avoiding direct demands. So using this kind of language, declarative language, which is uh, sharing observations. So not, not immediate, no immediate responses required. So saying like, I see your room could use some tidying instead of saying clean your room. Things like that, or I notice it's getting close to dinner time and your homework is still on the table. Instead of, um, so you're just making a statement really. You're not, you know, you're not really saying you need to do that, which will cause them to be more, like their anxiety start and they might go into that panic mode. Um, so using that kind of language um, really helps them to calm and, and also giving the choices. They're all great options for PDA. But, I better, let, I better let Simone talk because we're running out of time, aren't we? <laughs> no, that's all right. It's all very important information. I might just, because um, the slides and the recording will be available after, won't it, Mel? Yes, yes yeah. it will. So what I'll do is I'll just um, uh, flick onto a couple of the screens that I think are most important to highlight today and then um, people can read read the rest in their own time and um, reach out for support because yeah, obviously leaving some time for some questions shortly. So if I take control and so yeah, just essentially just wanted to provide some details around uh, care support and self care. So I suppose as well, I'll just briefly touch on just some statistics around carers and that Australia has over 2.65 million carers which equals to around 11% of our population. Seven out of ten primary carers are women and more than half of primary carers provide care for at least 20 hours or more per week. However it's probably really important just to note that all carers and caring situations look different as well. So in terms of accessing carer support uh, we have um, Carers SA, which is a common place to seek support. So Carers SA, statewide organisation with staff working across country and metro South Australia. Carers SA also provides services to young people between the ages of five and 25 who are acting in a caring role. Carers SA is our lead care provider in SA and provides a range of supports in, including um, carer breaks, one-on-one -on -one emergency respite, tailored support packages as well but obviously play a very strong advocacy role as well in terms of carers and carers rights. Um, sorry I've clicked on the wrong side there we go so um, this is a information brochure from the Carers SA website they also have a lot of additional information about their services information sheets and a lot of support on there as well. Um, so just moving on through, just leading, um, leading on from carers, there are a number of support groups that are available in South Australia. So I found that Autism SA has a really good um, register of support groups. So you're able to search uh, particular groups for your young person or supports for yourself as well and you can filter those by uh, locations, country, Greater Adelaide um, and Metro as well. So it's always a good idea just to have these um, sorts of services and supports in the back of your mind. Um, so moving through to some practical support. So obviously um, Centrelink payments are available for carers who provide additional daily care to someone. Um, it's always good to check obviously eligibility criteria, but um, having a chat with your GP can help start this process. 
Furthermore, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, or better known as NDIS, could also be another option of support. So in terms of funding um, to eligible people for a whole bunch of services as well. But again, um, have a chat with your GP and just, you know, knowing that it's really important to find a GP who understands autism and is knowledgeable around the various supports available. Um, I'm not going to touch on the self-care because I'm just mindful of our time. So just in terms of jumping along quite a lot. So just in terms of getting help with stress. So if you or family members are feeling very stressed daily, talking to a health professional might be helpful. So obviously some of what I've mentioned already is the emotional and practical services and supports available through Carers SA, respite care, NDIS support, support groups and financial support as well. And just as one last little thing, just a couple of websites that I've um, drawn on um, as well in terms of uh, some websites and some services that offer some really good support as well and uh, um, quite a good place to start if you're sort of looking for further information. So yeah, that's a bit of my PowerPoint in a snapshot. And yeah, obviously you can access a bit more information after this and through the recording. Awesome. Um, I'll just take control, mate. I'll stop the recording. And then if anyone wanted to ask any questions, um, you can uh, write in.